thank you so much, uh, Shadi. Uh, thank you to all our panelists. Uh, I think uh, you have all made very, very uh, strong and powerful uh, presentations about uh, not only the dire situation in Tunisia, uh, a year and a half after the, the coup of July 25, uh, but also on what uh, the US policy should be and what it has been. Um, which, uh, to summarize, I think most of you is that it, it has been a real disappointment, um, given that Tunisia was so close to, to achieving the dream of democracy in the Arab world, was so close to becoming a, a, a real democracy and a working, functioning democracy, um, still had problems, still the work was not, was not done for sure, still problems, uh, uh, economically, uh, in particular, the, the, the pandemic, uh, made the economic situation a lot worse. Um, you know, I was there in, in 2020 and 2021, and you can feel the, uh, the, 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 the economic, uh, collapse really that, that happened during the pandemic, um, the, certainly the first year. I want to mention the case of, uh, Khiyam Turkey. Uh, Khiyam Turki is a politician. Uh, he is uh, secular, but not anti-Nahda. He's, he's secular, but willing to dialogue with, with the Nahda. And he's been involved for the last seven months in organizing meetings between opposition leaders, just on the point that you mentioned, Shadi, you know, to try to unite the opposition and develop a roadmap for, for democracy. Well, he was arrested last Saturday. Uh, and the charge against him is a conspiracy against the security of the state for two things, for organizing these meetings between opposition leaders, uh, and many of these meetings were in, in his home, and uh, also for meeting with two U.S. diplomats, you know, that apparently he had lunch or dinner with two U.S. diplomats who, you know, were interested to know what was going on in Tunisia. These are the charges now, and and the, the um, we have not heard a single statement from the Biden administration yet on his arrest, and uh, it's been five days since Saturday. Um, many other politicians have been arrested. Nourdine Lepiri is undergoing surgery right now, uh, full uh, anesthesia surgery, and and his health is really deteriorating. Because he was beaten during his arrest, they broke his his uh, his elbow, and uh, was untreated since his arrest. And so now he's undergoing surgery, um, and it's still no statement from the Biden administration about these arrests, about these violations of human rights, and about and many many of them were arrested. Of the other politicians, were arrested for simply putting. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, you know, uh, posts for their opinions for, uh, on Facebook, you know, calling it a coup or calling for the opposition to unite against the coup. Now that has become, or, or ISIS Ayyad wants to make it a crime punishable by five to 10 years of jail for posting something on Facebook or on Twitter. This is the level that Tunisia has become one and a half year after the coup of right? and still no statement to this day from the State Department or the National Security Council or the White House or even Congress, for God's sake, about these really severe violations. So I think the situation is really, really alarming. And, and I think the United States really needs to um, review uh, its policies uh, towards the Qais Saeed regime. The, this, the policy of, uh, you know, half-baked criticism and half-baked uh, pressure has obviously not worked for the past year and a half, you know. And as you put it, uh, Shadi, half, you know, cutting the, 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 the assistance in half uh, is not, has not worked. The situation has gotten worse and worse every day. And, and I think the U.S. needs to, uh, to, to really... Uh, revamp and review and change its policy and put a lot more pressure on on Qais Saeed and um, and and also on the U.S. on the Tunisian military. I think the Tunisian military will never jeopardize 
their relationship with the with the U.S. military and with the U.S. Uh, you know government because it's a long-standing relationship that has been you know over 50 years since independence. They have a huge relations, huge interests with the U.S. military, and they're not willing to jeopardize that. And all we're asking them to do is to stay out of politics. That's all. We're not asking them to remove Qais Sayyid or to organize a coup against Qais Sayyid or anything like that. Just go back to your barracks and stay as a professional Republican army should be out of politics. That's the way it has been since independence. But now they are getting into politics, and I think the U.S. needs to issue very clear statement, even more clear than the statement that the Secretary of Defense issued last, I think, uh, June or July. It has to be very clear that this is totally unacceptable. And again, the U.S. administration still has not made that statement and has not made that clear reference to the, uh, the Tunisian military must take step out of politics, must, must stay out of politics. Okay, we're going to take about 15, maybe 20 minutes of uh, questions. Um, so uh, if you have a questions, you can ask in Q&A. So I'm gonna, we're going to give a, a priority to, to Q&A first. Um, the first question by Mansaf Khadr. If one takes into consideration U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Egypt since 2013, then what to expect from U.S. foreign policy regarding Tunisia since July 2021? So I guess it's about the similarity or the differences between uh, Egypt and Tunisia and the response of the U.S. government. Another question from Kevin Coyne is, what role should the UGTT play right now? You know, what is the role of the UGTT and what role can they play or should they play right now? Uh, so let's answer those two questions and then we will move on to other questions. Anybody wants to answer one of these two questions? Comparisons with Egypt and the role of UGTT. I can say something on the comparison with Egypt, but uh, Sharon's actually done right. a lot of, I, I want to just make sure Sharon says something about it too, because he's done a, a lot of good comparative work on, on uh, Egypt okay. and, and Tunisia and their militaries. But, you know, from my standpoint, um, so many, many of the people who were involved in Obama's Egypt policy and Middle East policy, which I think we're all pretty critical of, have returned um, and play some role in the Biden administration. So, you know, one way of looking at it is that there is some continuity. And the sense that I get, um, you know, from from a number of folks I've talked to in um, state and the NSC over the past year or two, is what I remember from the Obama administration, this sense of exhaustion with the Middle East, this sense that almost verges on a certain way of looking at Arabs. It's not usually explicit, but it is a version of, look, we, try, like, we tried with you guys in the early part of the Arab Spring, you know, then there was civil war and all this other stuff and uh, millennia old conflict. Some of you might remember in his State of the Union in 2013, I believe, um, Barack Obama explicitly said this. He was pretty much like, you know, raising up his hands and saying millennia old hatreds. That is what is going on in the Middle East. So this is not just my interpretation of what they think think they've actually sometimes also said it outright um the the kind of uh, de facto director of middle east policy in the biden administration is a big part of the problem he was also there under obama um you know i don't like naming names but i i do think that um you know without him changing his approach to the middle east so I'm talking about Brett McGurk here, who's the um, National Security Council coordinator for the Middle East and North Africa. Um, smart, competent guy, 
in many ways, but he does not. He let me put this nicely. He doesn't really believe in democracy in the Middle East. Um, and my hope is that, you know, um, that at some point there could be someone new in that position. Certainly, if there's a Democratic administration 2024 onwards, I think a top priority for pro-democracy advocates is to make sure Brett McGurk doesn't get a senior position on Middle East policy. Um, and the reason that he runs Middle East policy right now and, and has very little pushback is because um, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, again, a very smart, even brilliant guy, doesn't he he doesn't care about the Middle East that he doesn't care about democracy in the Middle East. He's never going to focus on it. He's not going to put pressure on Brett McGurk to do. More. So in some ways, I feel like it's partly a personnel problem. And that's just worth keeping in mind. And I think all of us who work in this space need to think much more carefully about how we can organize and prepare ourselves for 2024 in terms of trying to encourage and support better officials in these key positions. Okay, Sharon? Sure, so let me talk a bit about the military. Certainly the response of the US to Egypt 2013 and, and July 2021 for Tunisia are similar in terms of trying to maintain military assistance. And that's a normal response from the US and both due to inertia of trying to, to maintain what, you, what you've done before, but especially for security assistance, it's very easy for DOD as well as others to make the argument that security uh, cooperation trumps all other values, that that's most important in our relationship. And especially for some of these military training programs, the argument is always very compelling within uh, the administration that we must preserve our relations and our contacts uh, because those relationships are going to help us moving forward. And so there's always a tendency uh, not to suspend military assistance, even when it's explicitly a coup, uh, like in Egypt 2013, uh, and certainly when it's less clear, uh, like in July 2021. Uh, there is, of course, an important difference, right? July 2021 was not a military coup. The military was certainly involved and they helped to close the parliament. They've been uh, holding these military trials, uh, but it was not a military coup. At its core, it was a presidential coup. And so that, in turn, uh, does show some differences also uh, in terms of uh, the Tunisian military's behavior as opposed to Egypt's. Uh, on the one hand, we would have thought its professionalism, its apolitical professionalism, would mean it wouldn't obey and close the parliament. Uh, but as, as I mentioned earlier, the parts of its professionalism that it knows best, which is to uh, defer to the president, to obey his orders, to try to stay out of political matters, all of those pushed it actually to obey this order, to defer to the president that, yeah, it's probably constitutional, uh, to think that explicitly refusing would have been a more political action, uh, all of that its professionalism and therefore led it to obey uh, and close the parliament. And that's why I think it's important to have these discussions within the Tunisian military about what professionalism actually means moving forward. But the other major reason why the Tunisian military obeyed and closed the parliament, uh, and this here is a similarity with Egypt, is that there was some gains to be had in terms of its corporate interests uh, that Kais Said was advancing the military's interests, continuing to increase the budget, for instance, despite COVID, when you might have expected uh, the budget to instead go to the Ministry of Health, uh, to appoint military doctors as the Minister of Health, uh, more generally to give the military regular access to the president, political access that it did not have previously. All of that led it to think that its gains are going to be advanced even further uh, if it supports uh, this coup. And they were proven right to some extent. Now you see uh, a general appointed as Minister of Agriculture, uh, you see the budget increasing further, you see the political influence of the military growing even further. Uh, and so in that sense, there are gains that the military is having. But there are also some costs, and this is important. There are costs in terms of its image, domestically and abroad. 
at home. Uh, some Tunisians are waking up and realizing the Tunisian military is not the neutral professional military they thought it was. It does seem to be taking sides. Uh, and the Tunisian military doesn't like their image being tarnished. Uh, and so if that increases moving forward, that could shift the military's behavior. But I don't think it's going to increase because the main uh, thing that's tarnishing the Tunisian military's image, which is the military tanks around the parliament, that's soon going to go away. Once this new parliament takes office, uh, that's going to be reopened and you won't visibly see the military defending Gai Syed's coup anymore. And so instead, the cost that I think could possibly increase uh, is the one about uh, its international image and in turn the potential uh, break with relations or reduction in relations with the US moving forward. And so that I think gives the US some leverage and maybe is the only leverage that could switch uh, the Tunisian military's calculations moving forward, that there must be uh, a real threat uh, that military aid uh, will be cut in half for sure, repurposed perhaps, uh, but really on the line fully, uh, given, uh, as Monica noted, uh, the use of these counterterrorism uh, institutions, but language as well in terms of justifying uh, the crackdown that's occurring today. Those costs, uh, the foreign costs, are really the only ones I think could switch uh, the Tunisian military moving forward. Okay. Eric or Monica, anything uh, on the UGTT and the role of the UGTT? If it was okay with you, I had about like three or four points that I was going to make that would respond to a lot of the questions that have come in on the chat box simultaneously. <laughs> I'm happy to do that now okay. or whenever you want me to. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we still have uh, another five or ten minutes, but go ahead. You can uh, start. Okay. Um, I'll just add one thing to what Shadi and Sharon have said on Egypt, which is to reprise a comment from my initial remarks. We had a lot of reason historically and geostrategically to predict the United States would resume its support for dictatorship in Tunisia. In, Tunis in, in Egypt, sorry. But in Tunisia, we had no such reasons. Um, the US has typically been comparatively unsullied when it comes to supporting dictatorships in, in, um, in Tunisia. And like I said, it doesn't have any clear cross-cutting interests there, um, be it petrol or oil or, or support for Israel, you know, whereas Egypt has been one of the top recipients of, of U.S. foreign aid for decades now. So there, there does not exist a clear litmus test for the Biden administration's support for democracy abroad or lack thereof in Tunisia, and it's been making the wrong choices. Um, when it comes to UGTT, if UGTT decided tomorrow to pick up the phone and call all of the political parties and major civil society movements opposed to Kaya Saeed's regime, it could be the standard bearer of the cross-ideological opposition coalition that we've all been waiting for. But it has not done that because of what Hamel Hamami, the Tunisian Marxist leftist, called with me, uh, said to me in a great interview, he called it in the summer of 2021, the Anatha syndrome um, that Shadi had alluded to. And it's this Anatha syndrome, this paranoia about this almost uh, visceral revulsion against working with Nafta that's preventing UGTT from doing that. UGTT has itself um, experienced uh, a move towards authoritarianism inside the union with the leadership of its current Secretary General Nordin Taboubi, who was also a lot more focused on consolidating his own unilateral control of the labor union than he is in taking up that 2015 Nobel Prize mantle again. UGTT was a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in during Tunisia's democratic transition and putting the interest of the country first, which is very disappointing, but not surprising for close observers of UGTT over the past decades. Um, I wanted to say something about the IMF aid, um, potential IMF deal. I, I would add that an IMF agreement with Kaya Syed under these circumstances is actually against the IMF's own interests. If what the IMF wants to see is clear economic, neoliberal economic reforms in Tunisia um, or some kind, any kind of return on investment. Kaya Syed is not 
your garden variety dictator. He is not a Ben Ali. He is an ineffective authoritarian who's running what I have termed an ad hocracy. In other words, he's making it up as he goes along. He's chaotic. He's um, quixotic. He's erratic. And he's paranoid. And he has proven himself signally unable to build stakeholdership in his new dictatorship, signally incapable of working with UGTT, which was an initial cheerleader for his coup. He's not even managed to bring them on board, to bring them around the table. So I'm not sure why anyone in this circumstance would imagine that Caius Syed, of all ineffective um, erratic authoritarians, that Caius Syed, who appears so often to be like an old man tying and untying his shoelaces or tinkering with a toy train set in an attic, incapable of building st stakeholdership, incapable of, of doing a Ben Ali 1989 national pact and bringing around the initial cheerleaders around the table, why would anyone in this circumstance think that he could be the person to force through quite unpopular, qu quite hard to swallow IMF demands? What the IMF deal represents is a short-termist stability vote for Europe to keep the migrants away. And I call it short-termist because I think it's essentially throwing money down the toilet because Kaya Syed is not a person with an economic plan or who can build buy-in with these hard reforms. He's going to be even more of a money sieve, even more of a colander than Sisi in Egypt. Sisi has been such a colander for the IMF um, you know, the pit into which just more and more money falls, the, the gift that keeps on asking, that, that he has actually managed to annoy the Saudis, who have conditioned their own package of support for Sisi on the comfort of an IMF deal, which Egypt recently got, which then unlocked the Saudi aid. Which brings me to another point. If and when Tunisia gets an IMF deal, not only is it going to be short-termist, not only is it going to set Tunisia up as a continued expensive aid recipient and help um, prolong this destabilizing, um, I would argue, um, inevitability of Kaya Syed's collapse. <laughs> it's just going to prolong the pain I, it, on, on some analytical level. But it's also going to likely unlock Gulf aid. One of the great counterintuitive mysteries of Kaya Syed's young dictatorship is that neither the UAE nor Saudi Arabia, which have been quite keen to support counter-revolutions in the Arab world, have bailed him out yet. And it's actually been, and this is very surprising, but I've confirmed this amongst a variety of sources, it's actually been various European Union countries and the United States government that have gone tin cupping to Riyadh and Abu Dhabi asking for a bailout. Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, to their credit, are getting a little bit more um, discerning about where they put their money because of their bad experience with Sisi. He's been very expensive. Sisi has been a much more reliable ally for Riyadh and Abu Dhabi than Ben Ali, sorry, than Kaya Said ever will be. He's no Ben Ali. A lot of people wish he was. Amongst them, I think, are the US government, the European Union, Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, but he's not. He is an agent of destabilization. So they have conditioned their support on the comfort of an IMF deal. So we also have to consider, the IMF also needs to consider here, that granting Tunisia a deal might unlock, in particular, Saudi aid, which is going to set up, um, it's going to open the floodgates, potentially, for new external incentives and dictatorial tutelages to emerge that are going to lock the Tunisian people in a system of external interference that's going to be horrible, likely, for, for their ability to express and attain political freedoms moving forward. I think U.S. analysis within the State Department and in Tunisia has largely been weak, tepid, and misinformed, and insultingly divorced from Tunisians' lived realities, as the State Department um, statements after Syed's sham elections recently show. And I just wanted to, to say that there have been a number of coups in recent years in Myanmar and in various African countries, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Mali, Chad, Sudan, Niger. And you can take the Department of State's readout on any one of those coups and read them almost word for word and apply them to Tunisia. Ironically, on February 2nd, earlier this month, the exact same day that the State Department spokesperson called Tunisia's most recent sham elections, another step, quote, another step in the important and essential process of restoring the country's democratic checks and balances. He also made a comment about Myanmar. He said, 
the Myanmar military staged a coup d'etat and seized power against the will of the people, plunging the country into a deep political, economic, and humanitarian crisis. Over the last two years, the people of Myanmar have courageously demonstrated their commitment to a democratic country, demanding respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, et cetera, et cetera. But the military regime has violently cracked down on any form of opposition, including peaceful protests. You could copy and paste that basically for Tunisia, except instead of say, saying the military regime, saying the, the presidential coup regime or the military and ministry of interior supported presidential coup regime. So there's really been diplomatic malpractice at multiple levels in the Biden administration. Say one thing about China involvement. It's worth remembering that the vast majority of Tunisia's trade is with Europe. Over 85% of its foreign direct investment, over 70% of its trade is with Europe. All of the logical indicators indicate that Tunisia is very, very reliant on its relations with the European Union. It's not the easiest of places for China and Russia to gain a lot of ground very quickly. Um, in September 2021, Israel opened a Chinese-operated port in Haifa. The, the, the sole specific justification I've heard on this new Cold War great powers paranoia from members of the Biden administration to justify our genuflection to Kaya Sai's new dictatorship is the, post, the possibility that China will make a bid for the Radas port some, at some point within the next 10 years. China already has to operate support in Israel. It's very ironic. Does, is this worth it? Is this worth sacrificing the freedom and dignity so hard won, the democracy so painstakingly woven by Tunisians? I would argue it resoundingly is not. And one final point. Kaya Syed is not merely resurrecting uh, Ben Ali's police state. He's radically re-envisioning state military relations in Tunisia. He's trying to make Tunisia a military-supported presidential dictatorship like its neighbors. He's doing something radically different and very, very dangerous. So any military aid we give to Tunisia, let alone the counterterrorism funding, we need to, to subject to Pentagon, Congressional, and Department of State oversight with that recognition in mind. Thank you, Monica. I want to um, give the mic to uh, Munji Dawadi. He's the president of the Tunisia United Network. Um, it's a, a, a Tunisian organization that has been very active um, lately in Washington, D.C. Uh, Munji, um, uh, welcome. Um, are you? Uh, yes, another one. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Excellent. Andy. Thank you. Uh, listen, first of all, thank you, Radwan, and thank you, CSID, for putting this together. Thank you for actually bringing in these speakers because they are, uh, the, when we listen to them, when we listen to their analysis, and uh, we, we kind of, um, we, we feel validated when we are frustrated when we are talking to the American officials, uh, especially uh, at the level of the State Department or even the, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Tunis, which I had for the first time the chance to talk to them today at 3.30 a.m. Uh, the reason for that, T1 represents uh, Tunisian Americans. We don't represent all Tunisians. We represent a group of Tunisians in the U.S. who are opposed to the coup. We made several attempts. We made six, several attempts to talk to Joey Hood to meet with him before he goes. He, he it went silent on us. We campaigned for this guy. We, we talked to Ted Cruz, who was holding up his nomination at the at Congress so he can get through. And, and he refuses to talk to us for I don't know why. Uh, this, is, this is something that we face, and, it, and it's a bias maybe because there's a perceived notion that Munji or anybody like him are close to Nahda or they're tainted by this, uh, this uh, the, the, you know, the Islamist title. Uh, I, I don't understand. I'm frustrated. But, but, but we're going to keep pushing. We're going to keep exposing the incompetence. We're going to keep exposing the personnel that Shadi Hamid talked about of people who don't care about democracy in the Middle East. They all don't believe in democracy in the Middle East. And others, you know, who work in at the level where they're supposed to at least deliver facts as they are. People don't listen to the discourse that Kais Hayat talks about. I don't think they even translate or even understand the level, the hate, the, the polarization, um, Tunisia right now is, a, is, is all the preconditions for a civil war are there in Tunisia. We have one man who has all the power in his own hand and he's sowing you know, hate and, and, and insults his, his, his opponents at any level, at any chance he gets. 
and and he now he moved to a more aggressive approach throwing people in jail beating them up as they are arrested even if they are leading one of the most maybe most organized political parties to 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 capture Perry and beat him up to the to the point where he breaks his arm and to throw a former head of government in jail for two months with no clear charges to uh, to to charge people just based on the fact that they are talking to each other all the international community was asking from the opposition in tunisia is to have a discourse to present an alternative roadmap to bring the opposition together that's what hayam turkey has been doing and now he's charged with treason and now he's charged with with conspiring with a foreign country as if the us is an enemy of tunisia this is how qaisaid is treating the us i'm not sure if the officials in the us government are getting these messages and so for me giving him the imf loan just like monica said is just empowering qaisaid to even crack more on the opposition and throw them in jail and do even worse than what ben ali has done so i i just i just wanted to get in and thank you radwan and csd and all the panel for speaking truth uh, uh this morning so thank you thank you manji um before we go to a last round of uh, answers and comments by the panelists, uh, starting with Ricky, uh, I want to read uh, a question or comment uh, that we received from Jauhara Tees. Um, many of you know Jauhara was one of the founding members of the Constitution. She was a member of the Constituent Assembly. Um, so here's what she is writing, and I want you to maybe perhaps comment on that. As a Tunisian citizen, I do have an impression that the U.S. prefers to have one-man rule in Tunisia rather than a participative government. Uh, it is easier for the U.S. to get its interest, uh, interests served by exercising pressure on one man rather than exercising it on different parts of the government. Uh, that is why I'm so pessimistic and I do not expect anything from the U.S. administration to help restore democracy in Tunisia. And I'm hearing this uh, from many other people, by the way, in Tunisia, who are telling me that uh, the, the support that the military is giving to the coup since July 25 would have been impossible without the tacit approval of the U.S administration and and you know military um so they think that the u.s is you know tacitly supporting the school and really does not care about democracy uh, in tunisia or elsewhere in the MENA region so um i know it's very disappointing to all of you it's very disappointing to me if this is or uh, turns out to be true i still have some hopes that it's not true. I still have some hopes that the U.S. cares about democracy uh, in Tunisia in particular, but in the Middle East in general. But, uh, you know, there are doubts, you know, based on, you know, the response so far to the coup. So I guess I want to end with, with, with this question. Do you think that the U.S. cares about democracy in Tunisia? Do you think that uh, U.S. Um, has given up on democracy in Tunisia and and believes that supporting dictatorship serves its interest, uh, including in Tunisia. So that that's my final question um, to you. And then all of you, uh, please um, answer anything else you might you might uh, want to uh, answer uh, to the questions. You know, we received a lot of questions. Um, from our audience today so feel free to answer any one of them um, that you received in the chat or in the q a uh, we'll go ahead and start with ricky ricky go ahead please yeah thanks time it's running late so i'm going to try to be brief first um yes. the question you just posed radwan is the one that i asked at the outset of my presentation is there a tunisia exception to supporting dictators across the region and i argued that there there was such an exception within limits it's being sorely tested right now the evidence is very discouraging as our panelists have mentioned as for the egypt uh, um 
comparison. Uh, I think uh, Monica laid out very clearly that we are not looking here at one of the authoritarians who are, you know, classically, you know, he's a son, he or she is a son of a gun, but he, you know, he's a keeper, he's our son of a gun. Um, we're looking at somebody who's destabilizing and, uh, you know, whose future is less certain than somebody as entrenched as CC um, on the one hand. But when the U.S. makes these kinds of calcul calculuses, it also looks at the alternative. If this person were ousted, what's going to happen? And I would argue, I think it's self-evident, that the, the alternative in Tunisia is far less threatening to the U.S. to U.S. interests as it is in many, many other countries, including Egypt, as the U.S. perceives it. So it's, it's, it's both sides of, of that equation. Um, the other point that I wanted to make, Radwan, is again, where you started, which is to, you know, describe the current dire situation of the last week or so in Tunisia. Cause, um, since the self, uh, since the power grab of July, you know, there has been no watershed human rights atrocity like Rabat Square mm -hmm. in Egypt. The Tunisian police yeah. have not gunned down protesters. And so where there's been an arrest here, Bahiri over there. And, you know, it's been hard to get a handle on it because what, you know, the civil societies continue to act and their protests in the streets, dégagé and so forth. It's been less palpable, but I think this weekend is a watershed moment, the last few days where it's absolutely clear that we're heading down the slippery slope and uh, he, uh, the president has removed everything to grab onto over the last year and a half. He's dismantled the guardrails. So um, if there ever were a moment for the U.S. to speak very clearly, you know, it's overdue, but it should be right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, let's go to Sharon. Please. So, first, <laughs> any concluding concluding remarks or answers? Yeah. So, two quick points. First, I think there are some in the administration who still do care about democracy in Tunisia, but they're being drowned out by other voices who are making a strong argument that we have other interests: security, cooperation, great power, competition, and so on. Uh, and I think those counter voices are only going to grow in the next couple of months. Now that a parliament has been elected, uh, the military will withdraw from the parliament. I think those that are arguing that the U.S. should just move on, go back to business as usual, those voices are only going to grow louder moving forward. So I'm quite pessimistic uh, that you would see uh, a change in U.S. policy. But where I think we might see some reaction is, as Mungi and, and Ricky are noting, this growing rhetoric from Kais Syed that is almost genocidal, uh, where he's calling the opposition cancerous cells that need chemical methods uh, to get rid of, that he's going to purge and cleanse uh, the country. This, if it happened anywhere else, we would point to this, that this is genocidal rhetoric, right? When Gaddafi said this, uh, the US moved. Uh, likewise, I. I wonder if, as this happens, as Eric noted, there hasn't yet been an Abba massacre, but if something violent happens, right? We know Guy Syed's predilection, for instance, for the death penalty from uh, his campaign in 2019. If there is uh, something like that, uh, devastating as it would be, that might be uh, what gets the U.S. to move. But at that point, it's, it's too late. Uh, we need to keep pushing now uh, to get the U.S. to, to switch. Thank you, Sharon. Um, let's go to Monica. Monica, any final concluding remarks? Well, you know me, I've always got remarks. <laughs> <I'll keep it laughs> <brief>. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I agree with Ricky that Syed has demolished the guardrails. The emergency exit is still vaguely in sight but we're quickly hurtling towards a situation where the only exit might likely be a bloody exit. And we need to take that reality on board. As I said, we're baby steps away from Ben Ali in the 1990s or something that very closely resembles Egypt in 2013. Um, Kaya Syed is a destabilizer. I think if folks within the Biden administration, you're 
European Union or other governments are fed up with the values conversation, think that's too fluffy, um, and want to get down to brass tacks and only talk about security and China, Russia, great power competition, I'm happy to have that conversation. I think Syed is a losing bet on both issues, as my comments, I think, made very clear. Um, the US embassy has been divorced from Tunisians' lived realities. And it, in cooperation with the State Department in Washington, D.C., has been um, systematically releasing statements that insult the dignity of Tunisians across the ideological spectrum. Um, the U.S., instead of meeting with Syed's opponents and not doing high-level photo ops, let alone getting garlanded by Syed, has been doing the exact opposite. Um, in a bid to please Syed, the U.S. has mystifyingly been meeting with him and his henchmen, but not been meeting with the opposition. Um, a lot of the people who are being arrested right now are being arrested, or more, more accurately, abducted and kidnapped from their homes as we speak, in part because they've been meeting with Americans. We need to recognize that. And we need to keep the lines of communication with these Tunisians and with Tunisians across the ideological spectrum open. Um, we shouldn't be a self-castrating giant that gets intimidated by Kaya Syed so much that we won't even meet with the opposition. Um, I'll just read you a couple of the charges against Abdul Hamid Jalassi, who was a retired ex-member of Anatha, who actually left Anatha a few years back because he didn't think that its leadership was democratic enough. And he's been living kind of the life of a nerdy retiree and making Facebook posts and writing books that, frankly, only his closest friends and family will probably ever read. But he was dragged from his home on Saturday. His lawyers got the charges. They include one time he ate at a fancy restaurant with foreign researchers. He once had a coffee with Hayam, Turkey, the man you, you mentioned, Radwan. He stated in a radio interview that he's against Kaya Syed and the coup. These are the sorts of ridiculous reasons that if the situation weren't so tragic, would be absolutely comical for why so many people are being dragged from their homes, many of whom were tortured, raped, subjected to horrible abuses for decades under Ben Ali. And now they're being re-traumatized, re-victimized. What's the alternative? You know, I think this is one of the questions that folks within the US government ask out of laziness. I think the China-Russia pretext isn't a genuine, sincere pretext. I think it's a lazy pretext. A lot of people have given up on doing the hard work. They've given up on going out in the field and having meetings with Tunisians across the spectrum and thinking about what their real jobs are. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is not um, genuflecting, bowing down um, to sky aside with our statements until Tunisians magically create a unified platform. No, the, the alternative is respecting Tunisians' dignity enough to allow them, to, to at least not block them or stand in the way of them potentially resurrecting a form of government that enables them to vote out people they don't like. We call that system of government democracy, and it's still the system that polling strongly shows the vast majority of Tunisians want. And the United States government, my U.S. taxpayer dollars, are currently standing in the way of it. I'm sorry that Jauhara made the statement she made as an American and as a longtime scholar of Tunisia, it breaks my heart, but I very much understand why Tunisians are losing hope um, in the way that they have. I can only hope that, as Sharon said, we, we stay in conversation with the many people inside the U.S. government who are not lazy, um, who are caring, and who are trying to do their jobs and, and at least make the U.S. not stand in the way of, of Tunisians' dignity. Thank you, Monica. And now, uh, final comments, words from Shadi. Yeah, so on Johara's question, which I think is a sad but also a central one that we should think about, I'll say this. Um, knowing, knowing many of these senior officials and interviewing them in depth, including on these issues, they are not, for the most part, malevolent. In fact, the the vast majority are not. They don't wake up in the morning and think to themselves, how can we find new ways to make the lives of Arabs miserable? And let's find more ways to force them to live under dictatorship. I think that's part of what makes it challenging. Like, And I, 
I think a lot of it is neglect. And a lot of it is just having other priorities that, and they allow everything else to be subordinated under that. I mean, this is Jake Sullivan's position, which is everything is great power competition. And if, even if there's the smallest hint of risk that the Middle East could distract us, we can't do it. We're not going to even think about it. We're not going to put resources into it. We're not going to even ask other people to put resources into it. Does that make him a bad person? I don't think that's really the best way of looking at it. The entire structure of American Middle East policy is rotten. And that's what fundamentally has to change. And until it does, um, and and so someone, you know, someone asked in the in the chat, well, you know, something to the effect like, well, it's kind of hopeless. Um, and I mentioned the prophetic hadith, um, you know, tie your camp, you know, if you, well, I guess this, you know, applies obviously to Arabia, but, um, you know, tie your camel and then trust in God. That's the most we can do. We tie the camel and whether someone else comes and cuts the cord or steals the camel is, a, is outside of our control, but that doesn't mean we stop hoping and stop trying. And my hope is actually, um, not so much about the next year or two. My my hope is the next 10, 15, 20 years, um, a new generation of policymakers, a new way of discussing and debating these issues, a serious conversation among Americans about reorienting our foreign policy in a fundamental way. And we work to that. We work towards that. We make the arguments. We make the connections. We spread the word. And that's what we be, even if we're losing hope right now in this very moment, which I don't think we should, but even if we are, it, it's the long game here that matters. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Shadi, um, Ricky, Sharon, and, and Monica. I think this has been definitely one of our best webinars um, that we have organized on Tunisia in the last year and a half. Um, these are difficult times, as, as all of you have mentioned. I was much more hopeful a year ago or even six months ago that this could all be avoided. Um, and that, um, I was very confident that democracy is still possible in Tunisia, that, um, the, the ingredients for a successful democracy in Tunisia are still there, but, um, you know, the last few weeks uh, certainly have been a major disappointment. And the and the position of the U.S. administration and the Biden administration has been a major, major disappointment uh, to me and to all of us, I think, in terms of Tunisia in particular. Um, but again, thank you very much for these um, very important um, uh, presentations. Uh, we will continue our fight. We, we need to continue to work to convince policymakers in Washington and in other European uh, capitals that democracy is not only possible in Tunisia and in the Middle East, but it's the only way forward, it's really the only way to solve these problems and to have more stability and to have progress and to have economic development is through democracy and through the democratic institutions, not through dictatorship. I don't know why we keep making the same mistakes that we've been making for 60 years, you know, and, and it seems like we never learn from our mistakes. We support dictators thinking that dictators will provide stability. What kind of stability have they provided in the last 60 years? <laughs> they, 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 they destroyed the Middle East. They destroyed their own countries. They destroyed their economies. They destroyed everything. And yet, you know, we, we keep making the same mistakes. It's really unbelievable and, and shockingly so that we are still, you know, um, we still haven't learned the, the lessons. But really, uh, all four of you are, are doing tremendous job. Thank you very much for uh, speaking up uh, and for, uh, and you know, helping as much as you can to bring more light and shed more light to what's happening in Tunisia and in the Middle East. And hopefully, um, you know, we can fix the U.S. foreign policy and we can, you know, we can make it better. We can make it uh, more in line with our values, with our principles, 
with our interests, but also with the interest of the region and with the interest of the people of the region. That's really the, the best way to provide stability and to, to provide economic development. Again, I apologize to many of our participants. I see there are still few questions that we haven't been able to answer and also few raised hands, but we're way over our time. We're supposed to be ending one and a half hours. It's been uh, two hours but it's been uh, extremely, extremely beneficial and extremely rich uh, in terms of ideas and suggestions. Thank you all very much, and we look forward to uh, staying in touch uh, with you uh, soon, inshallah.